Good morning again. For our first talk today, we have Warren Mercer and Paul Rascaneras from Cisco Talos. Please, a warm welcome for Paul and Warren, presenting DNS Espionage. As you probably saw the, on, the, on the agenda, we, the title was DNS Espionage, because uh, when the call for paper closed a few uh, weeks, months ago, we only have this research uh, available uh, and public at this time. So, uh, since the end of the call for paper, we published more work about DNS hijacking and DNS threats more, more globally. So we changed a little bit the, the, the title and the content of the conference. So today it will be DNS on fire talk. And uh, we won't speak only about DNS espionage, as you can see on, on, on the agenda. But we will speak about another actor that uh, we named Sea Turtle. And we will present this both case, because uh, it's different actor, but the, approach, the philosophy is quite similar, and they basically target DNS. So yeah, new title and, and more content, basically. So first thing about us. So my name is uh, Paul Rascanier, and I'm security researcher at Cisco Talos for, for three years now, and uh, I'm working for more than 10 years on, on the uh, security community, uh, offensive stuff and defensive stuff. Now I'm only doing defensive stuff and mainly working on malware analysis. So I'm a malware guy and, and that's what I love to do. Except if it's Delphi, as you can see. <laughs> then it's but bad. <laughs> nobody likes to reverse Delphi. So, yeah. Well, we only have one clicker, clearly, so we have to change. Uh, my name is Warren Mercer, also a threat researcher with Paul at Cisco Talos. Uh, as Paul says, we, we like finding malware and pulling it apart. That's our thing. That's what we do. So today we're going to talk about a couple of different pieces of actors and a couple of different sort of pieces of malware we find along the way. Um, so I'm like Paul's work husband. The guy actually said, you guys are like wife because you're always together. And I said, funny, that's in my slide now. I didn't have to have that before, but I do now. Um, Paul and I speak a lot at a lot of different conferences, and hopefully you'll enjoy it. Hopefully it'll be fun. Um, so yeah, we, we do have an agenda because... Sometimes we don't, sometimes we do. Uh, today we do. So we're going to do a really brief DNS introduction. I'm going to assume a lot of people in the room know what DNS is, but if you don't, very quick 101. It's like five minutes, if even. Um, then we're going to talk about DNS espionage. Then we're going to talk about Sea Turtle. Um, really important to note here, these are two different actors. Campaign similarities are, are quite close. Some of the TTPs are quite close, but they're two distinctly different actors with two different agendas. Uh, then we're going to go over some protections and mitigations around DNS and what you can and can't do. And then Q&A, if, if we have time, I don't know, we'll see. Uh, if we do, no hard questions, just really easy ones. Uh, <laughs> so DNS protocol and DNS hijacking is primarily what we're talking about today. So the DNS protocol is a core fundamental part of the internet. It essentially allows me to go, hello, Paul, did you see YouTube.com? And Paul's like, yeah, YouTube.com's cool. If I go, hi, Paul, did you see 1.2.3.4? Paul probably won't be very happy about that, and I'll probably forget it after a while. So this basically allows us to type in Google.com. First case is an initial DNS resolver. Depending on your architecture and depending on your infrastructure, there's different ways this will and won't work. So for example sake, when I type that in, it's going to hit my local DNS resolver. If my DNS resolver does not know who that is, I'm going to go and speak to the TLD of that DNS, so .com, for example. So I'm going to speak to the top-level domain server that can tell me where this needs to go to. They may not know the answer, and they will go to the name server. So the name server will be the last point of entry for that domain name, so google.com's name server will reply and will let us know how to get there. Again, very fundamental. I presume everybody in the room knows it, but just to, to cover things very quickly. Uh, DNS redirection, which you may or may not know about again. Um, simply put, it's the idea of me asking for one thing, but being sent somewhere else. So if you see around Montreal, it's detours everywhere. It seems every time we come here, it's detours, but there's lots of detours this time. So if you think of DNS redirection, very similar to that. I want to send you somewhere else. Not necessarily where you want to go, but where I want you to go in terms of an actor control platform. Uh, chain of custody that comes with it. So how can an actor do that? They have a couple of different ways. Distinctly speaking, the easiest way is if I can compromise an endpoint or compromise credentials. I say the easiest. It depends how you go about it. Um, if I've got your DNS administrator credentials, I can go in and change whatever I want. Equally, if I've compromised your endpoint, I can edit your host's file and send you wherever I want anyway. So I can do it a couple of different ways. I can hack your DNS actual resolver in your own infrastructure. I can hack the DNS servers. So some of this stuff we're obviously going to be talking about today. Uh, or I can hack network infrastructure somewhere else to try and reroute you somewhere else. Uh, essentially, what I'm trying to do here is take you from A to B, but I want you to go via my C. So you'll get to B eventually, but only when I want you to get there. 
So these are just some of the, the points in time that you can do it. Obviously, you've got different protections that we're going to talk about later on through this. Um, so redirection attacks have been going on for quite some time. These aren't new. Uh, some of the techniques that we're going to talk about might seem new, but th they've been about for a while. So the earliest one is the Iranian cyber army, and they did a redirection attack on Twitter, right down to some more lesser unknown ones, like where they redirected blockchain so they could steal Bitcoin and other cryptocurrency credentials and information. So these are, I think, nine or ten examples that we have. Just, again, if you Google DNS redirection attacks, there's quite a few of them about. Uh, so how do we start, Paul? Yeah. Paul's so the hard worker, I'm not. So uh, it's basically each time we present something or we publish something, I always have the question is how did you start? How did you find it? How did you start to work on it, extra? So in this case, everything starts with the first event, DNS espionage. And uh, everything starts by a malware. Because as I said before, I'm, I'm a malware guy. I'm, I'm a reverser. I analyze malicious documents and stuff like that. So everything starts by that and by an actor using spear phishing uh, email, and more specifically, he used a uh, LinkedIn account to target specific people on, on company uh, and asking for a job, are you happy at your job, and this kind of stuff, and, and send a malicious document, not only by email, but via LinkedIn. And the point is, on your company, Maybe you blacklist LinkedIn, but if you don't blacklist LinkedIn, it's in SSL, it's encrypted, and you cannot really look at the LinkedIn traffic, and you cannot really analyze from network point of view uh, the file hosted on LinkedIn that uh, your users can download. So it's, it's pretty clever from a detection uh, point of view. So the attackers create two uh, fake websites named hr.wipro, hr.sencore. And uh, Wipro and Sankar are two real companies. And if you go on these two uh, websites, you will be automatically redirected on the real one. So if do you don't really make attention, you, you can think it's a real uh, website. It's two uh, HR-related uh, company. So here is a screenshot of uh, the LinkedIn message from the attackers to the victim saying, uh, yeah, you should download this document and fill it uh, if you want to have a new job. And obviously, this uh, document is a malicious document. The screenshot is from an uh, open-minded company. And uh, it's, it's how everything starts for, 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 the, for the attackers. So you've got this uh, malicious document. And uh, here is the document. So it's a real one. If you go on Sendcar website, and if you look at, I'm looking for a new job, blah, 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 you finish on this document and you need to fill it. So they take this document, the real one, and add malicious macro inside of this document. So the purpose of the macro was to download, oh, was to drop a malware, execute the malware on the targeted uh, machine. So the malware uh, is pretty basic from a technical point of view, but he has something very interesting is uh, he used HTTP to communicate to the attackers, which is something very really standard. And he used DNS tunneling to communicate to the attackers. So it's not something new. It, we already saw that, but it's not really common. It's not uh, something uh, really standard. And a lot of companies uh, do uh, analysis of HTTP. They use proxy and check where you connect, etc., etc. But less company check the DNS. They simply let the DNS do his job, because it's safe, you know. And the malware are two features, downloading stuff, uploading stuff, and executing stuff, of course. And he has two files, a configure.txt file, which contains the configuration of the malware. And uh, the attackers did a fail. Uh, they have a debug version, as every programmer have a debug version of their stuff. And uh, by mistake, I think they deploy the debug version on several targets with a log.txt, and in the log.txt, you've got all executed command and all output, which is really cool if you do incident response, if you have to create, yeah, yeah. But yeah, luckily, we, we found this uh, debug version first, and after we discovered that uh, it's not uh, as designed, it was a mistake from, from the attacker. Anyway, the HTTP communication, uh, even if it's HTTP, you need to use DNS, because DNS is how you resolve IP and how you know where is the server. 
And he basically make a random uh, DNS request simply to register the compromised machine and say to the attackers, hey, I'm here. And the attackers give you his IP. It's the purpose of DNS. And after that, uh, on our case, the malware included its own configure.txt file. But the attackers support the fact that we don't have any embedded configuration file, and I would like my configuration file. So he is able to communicate like that by using DNS to say, OK, I, I'm this target ID. I'm uh, FY in this example. And I've got the error code uh, 800 in, in hexadecimal, which means I don't have any config file. And the uh, attackers would give you your config file with maybe a new server, uh, maybe a new key for uh, data encoding, et cetera, et cetera. And finally, once everything is fine, <laughs> once you have your, uh, your configuration file, et cetera, you've got your IP, you've got uh, the domain, uh, the URL, and the malware connect on this website. The website is a fake Wikipedia page. If you go on it, you will see the Wikipedia uh, uh, layout. And it's where uh, <laughs> the magic happens. If you look at the source code of Wikipedia, the, the fake Wikipedia, of course, uh, you can see some comments here. And in fact, it's back to some base64 uh, command, uh, base64 encoded command, directly in comments on, on the source code. The malware can use a custom base64 dictionary. In this case, I put you without a, a custom one, so you can really easily recognize uh, the encoding if you are used to play with this encoding. Once decoded, here is uh, exactly the content of these comments. So basically, it's three different comments. The first one, he wants to get the username of the target. The second one, he wants to have the host name of the target. And the third one, he wants to know on which domain is binded uh, the machine. Domain from an Active Directory point of view, not from a DNS point of view. And it's clearly a reconnaissance phase. He's trying to, to be, he's trying to be sure the target is valuable, and it's not a researcher like me or Warren. The purpose is really to, I know I compromise the company ABC, I get the domain, I get the username, and I, I try to make a double check if it's really the company ABC. And don't forget, probably the attackers was on this same company a few months or years before, and he perfectly know the hostname pattern of the company. He knows it's eight characters, and the first one are letters, the last one is a uh, number. He perfectly knows the username pattern, of course, every company has exactly the same pattern. And he probably know, already knows uh, your domain. So he can, if he compromised you in the past, he can be sure at 100% it's a real machine or it's not a real machine. If you use Sandbox, probably your Sandbox doesn't follow your pattern for account, your pattern for hostname. And it's almost sure it's not connected and binded to your Active Directory. So here, yeah, yeah. With the, with the debug version, it's how, it's uh, uh, a screenshot of the log.txt file. So I receive command, I execute command, and I send the output to the attackers. So really useful if you have the debug version. The only missing part is a timestamp. Mm -hmm. They should add the timestamp. So it was the HTTP mod. It's really common. It's nothing really complicated and really new. And they have a DNS uh, uh, communication channel for uh, the C2 server. How does it work? Uh, in fact, you do some DNS requests. The first one is to register the node exactly as previously. Uh, I'm the ID uh, GT in this example, and I'm, I would like to register to you. And the attackers know, OK, I compromise this machine. GT is this, this target, and uh, yeah. How he, your machine can receive order from DNS? So it's, it's pretty easy. Uh, the infected machine sends this DNS request here, and it receives an IP, but it's not a real IP. Uh, it's a real IP, but it's not the purpose of the request. Uh, if you know ASCII uh, value, as everybody, uh, 100 is D, 105 is I, uh, yeah. Uh, 114 is R, and 0 is 0. So basically, the IP, if you convert it on, on, as a string, you have dir. The purpose is to execute the dir command. So of course, sometimes your command has more than four characters. So how works the malware? He's 
performing the request and until you have a zero somewhere. If you have a zero, it means, ah, okay, it's the end of the strings. I've got my full command. So, okay, you can receive command. You can execute deer in this case. How you exfiltrate data, because the attackers want to see the output of deer. Uh, same thing. Each request is part of the output. In this case, in Orange, you got a volume uh, in drive C, blah, blah, blah. And he performed a lot, but like crazy, a lot of requests to send uh, to the attacker the output of the command. So if you have a, a monitoring of your DNS, if you see a machine performing a lot of uh, requests with really random, weird pattern at the beginning, yeah, it's, it's probably uh, exfiltration. For example, I work on case previously where it was a malware exfiltrating credit card number. And how it works, he said, credit card number dot uh, malicious domain dot com. And the attacker simply look at the log and see I've got this credit card number, this request, which is this credit card number, this request, which is this credit card number, etc. So DNS exfiltration, it's really noisy from DNS point of view, but it works perfectly and you know nobody monitor DNS. So we did some uh, search about uh, the victimology, who performs this request, etc. For, for that, we use a Cisco umbrella, or historically open DNS. And uh, we saw uh, that mainly the activity was from the uh, Middle East, uh, specifically two countries in the uh, Middle East. And yeah, that's uh, basically uh, how we work for, for, for the malware. But yeah, I'm here to, to speak about DNS hijacking. So yeah, your story is nice. It's a beautiful malware. You use DNS, but, but what's the point for, for, for you? And in fact, here is free IP used by different sample of uh, DNS spionage malware. And I was looking at this IP, and one specific IP. I checked this story, what domain, what register on this IP, at what time, etc. doing classical uh, threat uh, intelligence uh, work. And I discovered one of these IP had, at more or less the same week, three domain for, from three different countries, and .gov dot the country. So basically, it's impossible that an IP be used by three government on three different countries, and it was for mail server. So it's it's really not normal. And we started to work on, on, on this case, saying, yeah, is there something weird? This IP well, seems to be used for DNS redirection or something like that. And we crossed this information with the transparency certificate uh, CRT. I don't remember. It's, uh, in fact, when you register, uh, when you create a certificate, a SSL certificate, uh, it appears on a database. And you can query this database to know every certificate created in the world at all. A specific time. Basically, look up the serial number of any created um, SSL certificate, and then be able to see what happened to it, or where it was used, and what IPs are related to. Yeah, and we discovered that at one hour, one hour after uh, this governmental DNS point to this IP, we discovered that a Let's Encrypt certificate was generated uh, by someone on this governmental domain. So that means the attackers have a control of the DNS, have a server, one of these IP, find a way to redirect uh, mailserver.gov.whatever to this IP, and at this time, as he has a control of the domain, he is able to use a certbot, for example. There is a talk about certbot just uh, yesterday, I think. And he used that to generate a Let's Encrypt certificate. And Let's Encrypt is trusted by your browser, by everything, so that's done. You cannot, you can, but most of the time you cannot see something change. You are on new IP, new certificate, and game over. So the attacker is able to make men in the middle on your, uh, on your domain. It's basically a camera about uh, how it works. Compromise DNS administrator, redirect uh, the domain to its own IP, generate uh, Let's Encrypt certificate, and he's able to do uh, man in the middle uh, on this uh, domain. Here is some statistics from the end of the year. So it was really, really active during September, October, November. Uh, and it concerned exactly our IP here. It's one of the DNS spionage IP. So if you look carefully, you have the feeling that the Let's Encrypt certificate is generated before the DNS redirection. 
but uh, it's not possible first. And in fact, uh, it's due to the uh, our passive DNS is not in real time. Uh, it depends on the replication, and we don't have uh, the DNS image of the world in real time. We lost one hour, that's why we have one hour, uh, the certificate one hour before. But it's simply due to propagation. It was really created after the redirection. So in this case, we have uh, six domains from six different countries, public sector, private company, redirected in three months, and the purpose was to target VPN gateway and mail server. So you can guess what kind of information the attacker uh, is looking for, was looking for. If we create a bigger timeline, we were able to identify this sector doing the same thing at least from the beginning of 2017. But he did it really, really uh, not often. And with the time, he did it more and more often. That, and he tried to reuse IP and he failed and we discovered it, uh, him at this time. So some statistics about DNS espionage actor. Uh, we identify more than 25 redirection on two years. Uh, at least two years, maybe more, but we, we didn't see that. Uh, peak of activity at the end of last year. And more than 10 countries. I think it's only Middle East countries, except uh, one country in Europe and US. So it's uh, mainly, mainly about uh, Middle East. And it target government, as I said, uh, mail server VPN. And it target uh, some private company too. So it's not only uh, public sector. It's, uh, but 90% is public sector. <clears throat> and then along came an oil rig leak, which is quite nice. So if you're not familiar with oil, oil rig, APT34, Helix Kitten, Maybe our next talk will be about how many names we need to give actors, but it keeps going that way for some reason. Um, so yeah, long came an oil rig, um, late March, April time, roughly. So what we started to see here was a clicker that doesn't work very well. Um, March, April time, this came out. So this came out with several assumed tool sets, um, web shells, a uh, tool called Webmask, if we're going to talk about, uh, victimology, screenshots of panels, things like that. So this was an alleged leak that had all of APT 34, so alleged uh, Iranian government. Um, we didn't see anything specifically related to DNS espionage from a source code point of view, but we did see some very interesting stuff, which is why we want to talk about it. So we've seen this, which was a panel. You may not be able to see that, so I'm going to point out. Um, all these countries, except this one, are all in the Middle East. So they're all in Lebanon. So that ties in very, very specifically with the victimology that tied in with DNS espionage. So very Middle East focused interested in very specific entities within those regions, not just Joe, uh, who lives in Lebanon, who's looking at Google. Uh, very, very different uh, methodology as to who they're trying to attack. So this is one of the panels that leaked from them. So we'll zoom in a bit. There was a, a directory called this was panel. So initially, when you see that, I don't see anything odd about that. It's another panel name. Paul, however, is very weird and has a very, very photographic memory. And Paul's like, I've seen this before. And I went, what? Said, no, you haven't. What are you talking about? And he's like, yeah, I have. Here, it's here. And I'm like, right. So this is from Lastline. So Lastline did a blog after we dropped the espionage information. Uh, they got access to a, basically a C2 server. And on that C2 server, they were able to access the Django instance. On that Django instance, they had a panel path. And the panel path is not identical, but it's almost similar. So it's very hard to make out, but it says this was panel, essentially. This one says the same thing. This was panel. So no, that made this, us this is, in fact, it's a mistake on the red stuff. Yeah, the, the red bit's wrong, but I wasn't going to point that out, Paul, because you did that bit, not me. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so essentially, you've got a different string of characters along here. So this was panel has a lower KSL, but in here it has an upper KSL, some things like that. So it's essentially this was panel. Um, so that made us think, well, that's very interesting, because if oil rig have this same panel name, that's not a, a completely dedicated way of linking attacks to attacks, but it's very interesting when you start to look at some of the other overlays that come with it. Um, so the panel path, yeah, there's the right one there. So lowercase l, uppercase l, lowercase e, uppercase e, et cetera. Uh, I mean, as it says here, you can't really draw a firm conclusion from that, but anyone else who does research in this industry will take snippets of information like that and build from it. Obviously, you don't get the whole picture straight away, so that we find very interesting. Uh, so then we started to look more into the oil rig leak itself, started to look at some of the tool sets that came out with it. Uh, the interesting one that we want to talk about is Webmask. 
So WebMask is essentially a, a framework that lets you do man-in-the-middle redirection, which, funny enough, coincides exactly with what DNS Spinach is for. So that's why we started to look at it. Look, they even give you a nice solution guide to set it up. So this is some of the excerpts from the, the scripts. You can get these. They're all over the internet. Just Google oil rig leak, and you'll find a zip. Um, be careful, obviously. We don't recommend you do that, but be careful. Uh, so on it, you get things like a solution to be able to set your environment up, and like even things like install Vim and install Screen, Every, everything that you need to do. Um, you'll see, basically, other variables used within it. So there's a JavaScript file. Uh, this is mainly Python. So there's like three or four Python entities, a JavaScript entity, and a config file from memory. First point that you see here is basically the setup. So how to set your environment up to get ready to do what you want to do. They then have a, an ICAP platform. So ICAP is the Internet Content Authentication Protocol. Essentially, it's a bit like WPAD, where you can have automatic proxy and, and, and transparent proxy use. It's to try and save load on proxy servers that you have. So WebMask actually thought about its resources on like, some developers that we work with. Some developers don't care on like, all the resources. These guys were a bit smarter and tried to be careful with your resources. Again, things in here are log files, credential files, cookie files, so all the information that you want to be able to inject into your man-in-the-middle platform. And then they use the squid proxy to bypass it. And then, as Paul mentioned earlier, they use certbot for certificate creation. So that's quite, um, quite interesting to us, because when you look at the, the victimology related to the panel that we showed you, so that panel is called Scarecrow. Very, very similar victimology, Middle East, Lebanon. When you look at the methodology that these guys are using within their Python infrastructure, it's that they want to build a DNS man-in-the-middle platform, exactly what DNS Minash uses. We are not saying it's 100%. Linked to OilRig, APT34, Helix, Kin Helix Kitten, it's absolutely technical possible. But what if we told you maybe it's not? That's the difficulty with attribution, obviously. Um, we're basically saying that technically, if you took this information in these files, you would be able to do exactly what DNS Spinach did. But we're not able to tell you, fundamentally speaking, it is actually related to OilRig. The commonalities are there. The similarities are there. People can draw their own conclusions. Um, so then along came event number two, which was Sea Turtle. Uh, so Sea Turtle was a massive attack on the core infrastructure of the entire internet. Uh, by that we mean like root servers were compromised. We've seen core DNS um, as mechanisms compromised. It's a, a very interesting, <laughs> very interesting actor. We're not going to go into a lot of technical detail about this because some of it we haven't published, but I'm going to give you a really good overview of what happened and how it happened. Um, people are maybe wondering why it's called Sea Turtle. So <laughs> uh, one of the guys that we were working with at the time, a guy called Danny. Danny was actually watching National Geographic at the time. And there was a, a show on about sea turtles. So he was like, oh, we need a project name. Bang, 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 sea turtles. And that was an internal name that wasn't really meant to go anywhere. And then when we started writing about it and we published it, we'd left sea turtle everywhere. And we were like, ah, fuck it. <laughs> sea turtles there. So, <laughs> so we went with sea turtle. Um, and we do have an awesome graphic department. So the graphic department were like, normally there's like, a rat in here, or there's like some sort of weird thing, but like this is just a turtle. We're like, yeah, it's just a turtle. She's like, okay, and she made this. So yeah, our graphics department is awesome, because Paul and I suck. So as I say, I'm not going to really go into technical sort of methodology of this, uh, the malware and stuff we haven't published, we haven't spoken about. So we're going to talk about how it happened and what they're trying to do. The clear primary motive that came with Sea Turtle was espionage. Uh, again, this is very, very focused on a certain region that we'll talk about in a moment. These guys were not interested in credit card numbers. These guys were not interested in things like um, how many users have you got in your infrastructure. These guys are interested in how do you build these rockets? What are your planes made out of? How are you building your roads? This is proper high-level espionage. Primary targets and victims that came with it, uh, Middle Eastern and North African government departments, intelligence agencies, oil and gas infrastructure, and military. These guys are not messing about. They're not attacking, as I mentioned, Joe in Lebanon. They're attacking ministries of defense, they're attacking military contractors, they're attacking oil and gas chemical companies, they're attacking actual government agency departments. They know very, very specifically who they want to attack. That to us means that this is very much a state-sponsored attack. Um, we believe they're one of the first publicly confirmed cases of a DNS registry compromise. We're going to talk about registries, registrars, and registrants in a moment because it's all very confusing. Um, this was with Packet Clearinghouse, a company in the US. We actually published um, some information to say that they've been compromised, and we believe it to be related to Sea Turtle. Uh, so this is what victimology, <coughs> excuse me, sorry, this is what their victimology looked like. Our primary targets were all in the Middle East, so Albania, Lebanon, Egypt, UAE, Syria, Iraq, etc. All very, very specifically located within the same geographical region. 
what these guys did is they had a, they had a primary target list. So these are guys that they absolutely wanted to compromise, they wanted to get access to, they wanted to find out information about. What we've seen with Sea Turtle was a, a not so much a sophisticated step, but a very interesting step. Obviously, if I'm trying to attack someone in the room, if I want to attack Paul, I might not start out with Paul, because Paul's very smart, Paul knows what he's doing, but I may start with Paul's child, because Paul's child probably isn't as smart as Paul. Might be smarter than me, but not as smart as Paul. So I'll maybe start with Paul's child as my secondary target to get to Paul. So what these guys did was essentially the same thing. They compromised two different infrastructures and organizations, one in Sweden called NetNode, who is a domain registry, and one in the United States called Packet Clearinghouse, who are a non-government organization who specifically help root server organizations, companies, etc. Uh, they help with the mechanisms that are associated with root server infrastructure. So that is our victimology mapping. Again, very similar to DNS espionage as well, but very important to note, these are two distinctly different actors. They're not the same actor. Uh, so yeah, we'll do registrar, registrar, and registrant, because it all gets a bit confusing. So we have three main elements when you have a DNS record. Um, why did Turtle go for registries and registrars? Well, the difference basically is a registry and there's an organization that manages a TLD, so a top-level domain, right? So Verisign owned .com. I probably should have checked to see who owned .ca since we're in Canada, but I, I didn't, so apologies. But Verisign managed the .com TLD. Um, the registrar is in an organization that is allowed to sell that infrastructure, that domain name. So for example, GoDaddy. So GoDaddy can sell .com domains. So you can go on and buy a, a domain off GoDaddy. The registrant is you, an individual. Obviously, that's not all true nowadays because of GDPR within Europe, so the, the data doesn't always make sense. So why, why would we use some of this information and what we do? The registrant used to be a really interesting, stroke easy way to map out C2 infrastructure to be able to see other common domains that were associated with registrant information. Some stuff that we'd have used that for. Registrar and registry would have been good for things like where well, you can buy a domain from, did they compromise a the domain, did they compromise a the registry, etc. So C Turtle went after both of these guys. Methodology that they went through was, again, very similar to DNS espionage. Gained initial access to an entity, so that could be the registrar, the registrars we'll talk about, or it could be an actual individual organization. Uh, the attacker then moved through that environment to obtain credentials, so lateral movement and then credential harvesting. They then exfiltrated data from those environments and organizations. The attacker then accessed the DNS registry, so google.com, or sorry, not google.com, godaddy.com. Uh, for example, and they were able then to change the name servers associated with those pieces of infrastructure and those domains. So how that looks is essentially break in. So Turtle used various publicly known exploits. We published a list of, I think, eight. Um, they're not exhaustive, and Turtle has been very good at not using only publicly known information when they want to get somewhere. If they hit a wall, they have generally been able to break through it, which again suggests they're a very sophisticated and very well-funded organization that was carrying this out. So use of publicly known exploits, break in, go through the network infrastructure, then break into the registry panels by taking the information that we've got from here, change the registry records, and then put in your own malicious name server. Now again, as Paul mentioned, if you monitor your infrastructure and you monitor DNS, this should be pretty easy to spot, because when you start seeing network traffic at a DNS level going to a random IP that you're not familiar with, you can pretty quickly realize this, because all of a sudden your traffic starts going to a domain server, or sorry, a name server that you're really not familiar with. Knowing your own infrastructure helps a lot here. Again, being able to monitor that also helps. So this got them into the first side of it, which is maybe a registry C panel, so a control panel to change the name server. C Turtle then moved on through to do multiple levels of DNS targeting around their own actor control servers. Uh, so what the actor did here was go in and falsify A records. So an A record is a record that you get back when you type in google.com, for example. It tells you how to get to that location, that resource. C Turtle then provided a, a man in the middle instance, which again could be linked with Webmask. Um, this man in the middle instance was used as a server to steal credentials and credential harvest, again, exactly what they wanted to do. Once they'd stolen the credentials from the man in the middle server, so they'd logged them, they'd taken them in, they have them, victim was then passed on to legitimate service. The attacker is now able to authenticate in those platforms. So if you think about what that could be related to, if you think of your own organization, webmail, VPN, any other mail services that you use internally, any Jira, Confluence, GitHub, any SVN type infrastructure. So I've got your mail, got your source code, got your HR data, got your financial data. I mean, what more do I need? As a sophisticated actor and attacker like this, I'm gonna go after really interesting stuff that maybe exists in your development department. So that could be code or information that relates to how your oil pump works. It could be how your missile fires. It could be how your defense systems operate. 
Again, these guys are not attacking random everyday people. They're attacking very sophisticated and very high level targets. So what does that look, again, from a quick overview? Malicious name server will be intercepting the traffic that will be passed to the DNS server. The victim obviously has no idea what's going on at this time. As Paul mentioned, similarly with DNS espionage, they used X509, so certificates. Sometimes let's encrypt, sometimes they'd stolen certificates from inside the infrastructure as well. Yeah. And they would pass, it, go ahead. Yeah, I've got this one. Yes. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So something really important is uh, on several specific targets, they don't generate a Let's Encrypt certificate, as I mentioned previously for DNS espionage, but they directly stole the real certificate of the target. So in this specific context, even if you have SSL pinning, for example, and you check the certificate, it's valid and it's this one specifically, you cannot detect the man in the middle. Because before doing that, they stole the legitimate, the real certificate of the target. So you cannot base only the monitoring on uh, the SSL pinning concerning this actor. And it's one of the big difference between the previous one and this one, is this approach and the TLD uh, targeting Registry approach. Yeah. Yeah. And so something to think about there is whenever I steal a public certificate, that's really easy. I can go to google.com and download their certificate and use it. However, for me to be able to get data out of that, I also need to have the private key associated with that. So we've been asked before, yeah, but anyone can steal a public key. Yes, but put two and two together. If I steal a public key and reuse it in my own service, how do you think I got access to that data? How do you think I see that infrastructure and how do you see that network traffic? These guys were able to compromise and steal both sets of keys needed, so public and private key entities. Uh, so what, what do we see here? Um, we see a highly sophisticated actor who's generally extremely motivated, doesn't care what they come up against. Uh, they have no lack of concern when we call them out and, and disrupt their, their whole infrastructure and disrupt their whole action. Um, generally, whenever we publish something, it stops, so you don't see it anymore. And then maybe it comes back months later, but it's slightly different, slightly changed. These guys are like, yeah, we don't care, so just keep going. I mean, th that to me proves that it's not just a guy in his bedroom. It's a... It's a proof they don't care. It's, yeah, absolutely, yeah, they, they don't care at all. Um, as it says there, it's common for actors to sort of cool off. These guys didn't cool off at all. Um, they are clearly aggressive in their play. They changed up the whole sort of game of who you attack and what you attack. Never before has there really been a massive attack on the core DNS infrastructure like this, i.e. attacking registrars and name servers and registers. Uh, it's generally been, we've seen things like BGP redirection where we attack core routers and, and core infrastructure like that, but never at the real base of, of DNS, which is required. Um, so what do we see? Yeah, attacking TLD, CC TLD, GD TLDs. It's really, really important to note there, if these guys had been stupid, they could have brought down the whole internet. And I don't say that flippantly. I mean, when you compromise a name server and you own a name server, you can essentially bring down everything else and poison everything else and do whatever you want along everything else. These guys did know what they were doing. They, they were very specific and very um, alert of what they were doing. If they hadn't messed something up, the whole internet could have essentially been brought down. Um, they have a clear path to DNS manipulation attacks. That's what they wanted to do. Uh, slightly different from DNS espionage is that these guys wanted to break in and get at those things like root servers to control much more of the interesting traffic. Abusing certificates. So we've seen abuse certificates, sorry, uh, certificate abuse before. Uh, it's something that happens, but seeing attackers break in and steal both sets of keys to be able to use those infrastructures over and over again is quite interesting. Um, what they did there was steal legitimate infrastructure, or sorry, steal legitimate traffic and steal legitimate certificates and then push out. So it, again, as Paul mentioned, it, it really brings in a really increased level of difficulty when you want to try and detect, detect some of this stuff. Because if you do do things like certificate pinning, well, the certificate is right. There's nothing wrong with the certificate. It is exactly as it should be. It's just going to the wrong resource in the wrong location. So that's normally what happens, as I mentioned. We disrupt them and they say bye-bye. And they're happy to leave and the attackers go away. But unfortunately with Sea Turtle, they just went, uh, actually, we're not amused anymore and we're going to keep doing this. And so they did continue to do it. <laughs> Protection is Paul. Yeah. So... We saw how uh, these two attackers work, and uh, let's speak a little bit about protection. So <laughs> I, as always, we don't have a magic solution, sorry. If you expected a magic uh, bulletproof solution. So something interesting is at the beginning of this year, I think it was in January, uh, the uh, DHS, so Homeland Security in the US, uh, published an emergency directive uh, 
taking our publication and, and co publication from competitor and explaining how bad it is and uh, give some uh, uh, way to detect stuff and protect infrastructure. And I'm going to simply uh, pass this different technique because we don't have more than more solution and more uh, techniques for, for you. So just, sorry, Paul. Yep. Just to point out, so a, an emergency directive, if you're not familiar, that means that companies must follow that information. They must follow that directive. So the information that the DHS released was related to how they should be monitoring DNS logs and infrastructure based off the DNS espionage research that we published. But it's, a, it's not just a, you guys should think about doing this. It's Department of Homeland Security telling US citizens, companies, organizations that they must do it. So it's not just a, please maybe think about doing this. It's a, you need to get this done in a certain period of time. Yeah. So the first thing is, as always, monitoring, monitoring, monitoring. So a lot of companies monitor DNS but the monitor the outside DNS. They have a passive DNS to know at this time this machine on the internet has this IP. But before we publish all this stuff, they almost never uh, monitor their own DNS. <laughs> they only monitor a potentially bad DNS. But in this case, the bad DNS is your DNS. So uh, first thing, start to, to monitor your own DNS. And uh, same thing for certificate. Monitor your certificate. As we say, uh, C-Turtle take certificate and use legitimate one. But maybe it's not really your threat model. <laughs> maybe you are not uh, targeted by this specific group. Maybe you are more targeted by DNS espionage group with people that don't really, are not so advanced and prefer simply to uh, acquire a free Let's Encrypt certificate and you can easily uh, detect that, especially if you don't use Let's Encrypt at all in your company. Maybe if you start to have Let's Encrypt certificate generated, you, you should take some time and look at it. And don't always use your own DNS, because obviously if your DNS is compromised and you monitor DNS through your DNS, uh, it's not really clever. So use your DNS and use third-party DNS too, because there is less chance that you and your third-party DNS are, are compromised. Another point is authentication. If you look at DNS spionage guy, what the the attackers did is simply, he stole the credential of GoDaddy, go on GoDaddy and click on the interface and change uh, the IP of this specific domain. So you can add, I think, I don't know for GoDaddy, but I hope so, you can put two-factor authentication. So if uh, the attacker stole the credential, is not enough to connect on the web page, change the setting of your DNS, and do the mad in the middle. So, yeah. It's, it's, it doesn't really dedicate it to this case. It's more globally used to factor authentication. Uh, patch, of course. Uh, it's not specifically for this case, but you need to patch. Here, uh, I put the vulnerability used by CTurtle to compromise uh, targets. So it's, uh, I don't know, 6, 7 uh, CV. And uh, it's, uh, it, you have patch, and you need to apply this patch, because uh, if it's a front web uh, remote code execution, yeah, you lose, basically. And uh, revoke and reset, so it's more if you are compromised. Of course, you need to uh, revoke all your certificate, reset all your credential, and start uh, to uh, uh, investigation on your infrastructure. Because uh, on all the case, if the DNS was uh, uh, redirected, it was a second step before the attackers was inside of the infrastructure and after he, done, he does the redirection. So if you identify a redirection, you have two problems, the redirection and he was here before the redirection. So you have to do uh, two works. So conclusion, I let you do. You speak <laughs> a lot, you love to speak. <laughs> oh yeah, because you don't talk either, yeah. Um, <laughs> the conclusion for us is, I mean, DNS is something that we all use. Every single person in this room uses DNS. Uh, I would imagine, as Paul said, sea turtles probably going to impact very few people in this room, in this country probably, given their victimology. But it, it's, it's really important to know that these guys are, they're after really, really important pieces of information. They will not stop at anything to get out of it. It's clear that they're, they're happy to compromise whatever they need to to get to the points where they can get the information they want to gather. Uh, we obviously, we don't attribute, uh, Cisco very rarely attribute. We will tell you it's a nation state actor because that's who we believe it is. Uh, we believe they want to get very interesting, very detailed information, very specific information. Whereas with DNS, we've seen it to be a little bit more, I do want to try and 
say DNS Spinaz is not a good attack or a good platform or a good piece of malware, it, it is, but it's, it doesn't really touch what Sea Turtle touched. They don't really go for the same victimology. And for us, that's a major differentiator here. We're seeing victims of basically low level hanging through, through, through the likes of DNS Spinaz, where they're sending documents and details. But then we're seeing the likes of Sea Turtle come out and go after registrars, registrant, or registrars and registries to be able to basically do what they want to do. And as I mentioned at the start, that's cyber espionage. That's getting very important information that no country, no organization, no person wants to lose individually. The likes of DNS espionage, it's OK, really, if you get compromised and you lose your credentials to your webmail. But if you lose the plans to something very specific that's very important to your national defense, that, that's slightly different. Obviously, both suck. but one is a, a, bit more, a bit more scary than the other. Uh, we mentioned patch, simple stuff like that. We mentioned monitor, simple stuff like that. These are things that people always want to do but never seem to be able to do, whether it's resources, whether it's capability. I mean, monitoring things like your DNS is something you should all be doing, regardless of what your organization does. It's a really, really interesting form of intelligence in terms of what's coming in and out of your infrastructure. It's a really good key piece of telemetry that I think you should monitor. Um, and, and really, what, what we're trying to say here is pay attention to your DNS. <coughs> don't let these guys get at you. If they do, please let us know, because we'd be more than happy to help. And hopefully, you don't ever get hit with something like DNS spinach. And that, I mean, I think our conclusion sums up. Be careful what you're monitoring and go with that. that the sense around your DNS, these attackers used core DNS infrastructure that we all need, every single person in this room needs. And they did it with, obviously, recklessness and abandonment. They did it with a bit of finesse because they didn't break everything, but it was reckless in abandonment. They didn't care, essentially, but they were very careful at the same time. Yeah, or as someone uh, wrote me on Twitter after publication, maybe we should use slash DC slash host file. <laughs> yeah, let's not do that. <laughs> <laughs> let's not do that. And uh, so if anybody has any questions, please feel free.